Hey, what's going on guys? It's Matt back here with another video. Today we're doing a long awaited review, at least I think so. I got a much more positive response than expected on my Sigma DP2 Classic video. So I bought the Sigma DP2 Quattro. I already bought this by the time I reviewed the DP2 Classic, but you guys showed a lot of interest in that and the Foveon sensor. So I decided to buy this really weird, crazy looking thing and, and do a review and um, tell you my, my experience and my thoughts on the Sigma DP2 Quattro. So I should say I'm primarily a Fujifilm shooter. Um, I've talked about this in my, my previous couple camera reviews, but I have two X-T3s, an X-T2, an X-100 original right now. That's my current Fujifilm lineup. So I have four Fujifilm cameras, and uh, I, I piqued my interest when I watched a Matthias Berling video on a, a Sigma Foveon camera. And so I tried out the DP2 Classic, which is a really nice cheap camera. I think it was like 200 bucks. I really liked it. It was a pretty low resolution camera. So I decided to get this Sigma DP2 Quattro. It also has a Foveon sensor. I should have wrote down the specs or memorized these before the video. I'll put it on screen what it exactly is. But I think this comes out to like uh, 15, 16 megapixel image from this camera, but it's 16 megapixels on multiple layers. Um, so, uh, 16 megapixels for red, blue, and green. And, um, that's the, the Foveon sensor. I talked a little bit more in depth about this. So if you want a more thorough explanation, check out the, up here on the other side, the Sigma DP2, uh, classic video I did. And I explained that a little bit better, but uh, so this has an effective resolution since each color layer has its own set of megapixels. It has like an effective resolution of like 35 or 40 megapixels. So it's getting closer to like medium format uh, levels of image quality. And I do have to say it has a really great, really, really great image quality. But the, the price you have to pay to get that image quality is that it's a very light hungry uh, sensor. So... I wouldn't recommend shooting above base ISO, which is 100. So uh, it's best on a tripod, especially in low light situations. Um, I think this camera is best served for landscape photography or maybe uh, studio portraiture, but um, it's a fixed lens. So it has a fixed 30 millimeter focal length on it's an APS-C size sensor, but it's a special sensor. So it has like medium format uh, image quality, but so this has basically uh, equivalent to a full frame 50 millimeter look uh, f2.8 so it doesn't open up too wide either so it's not great in low light so yeah let's just get into the physical aspects obviously it looks really weird it's a very unique looking camera that's one way to put it uh, the grip is basically backwards <laughs> like usually camera grips they stick out so you can wrap your hand around it and hold on to it the Sigma said, no, <laughs> we're, we're not, we're not going to do it like that. They decided to put it the other way. They claim that it's for better ergonomics and the best way I can figure to hold it is like just putting that part that sticks out in the palm of your hand and just wrapping your fingers or fingers around. But it's really a two handed camera, especially with this viewfinder. So I do have to come clean and say that the camera is really not, not as huge as it looks with the viewfinder. Um, but this doesn't have a viewfinder. That's the that's the thing. So it, it is a lot smaller and slimmer. I can take this piece off that the viewfinder goes on, and it can be even smaller yet. It's pretty thin, but because it's so long and because the lens sticks out a good bit, it's not anywhere near like a Fuji X100, uh, where or a Fujifilm like compact fixed lens camera, where it's all about the size and stuff. Uh, I, I guess Sigma's business model with this is they figured that this is a more niche thing. Only certain photographers are going to want a Foveon camera and to go through that hassle and deal with its limitations. So um, it's a better business model, I guess, for them to segment it so it's a fixed lens camera. And then if you want a different focal length, you have to buy a whole new camera. I wish I had that more versatility, but then I guess I would have to buy into a whole lens lineup. So there's, there's, you give and take a little bit for the fixed lens. Um, but yeah, the ergonomics and size are undeniably very weird and you can just say unique. The viewfinder is actually great. Um, I got a really good deal on this. I, got this in the original box with a lot of accessories with two uh, first party batteries the lens hood and this viewfinder which i think just by itself is an extra couple hundred dollars i got it for six hundred dollars uh, all that together which is a pretty good deal i mean it's 
it's relative. I mean, it, it's not bad for, for what you're getting and all the accessories included, and especially that the, I think this will have pretty good resale value. I think I can sell it for at least as much as I bought it for. Um, this camera came out in 2014, so um, it's really not that old. And to be honest, it feels a lot more modern than even the Fujifilm cameras that I shoot that have that came out in that time. I think uh, so the closest thing I would have is the XE2. This is definitely, I guess it's just a more premium camera than the XE2 because they have to give something if they're having the fixed focal length, it has to be really nice. The buttons are all super nice. Um, the shooting experience is actually very fast and snappy. I like the Sigma menu and um, I like just, uh, there's no aperture ring, but you basically, you just shoot it like a film camera. I pretend that I just have ISO 100 film inside, so I just have that. You have to go into the menu to change the ISO, um, but I just keep that at the same thing all the time. And then one of these knobs up here is for aperture, and the other one's for shutter speed. There's my exposure triangle. I can shoot it completely manually and um, get great images. Uh, I do have to say that the auto white balance is not that great. You can just lock off your white balance or change your white balance every shot. But if you are like a newer photographer, you're probably not going to have a good time with trying to correct the white balance in, in it because a, a big draw with, with the Foveon sensor in these Sigma cameras is the color. It can be completely negated by the fact that the white balance is bad. So either set your white balance for each situation that you're in or get really good at correcting the white balance to get uh, the correct color if you want uh, to take full capability of this camera. Um, it um, short shoots good JPEGs. I'm not a JPEG shooter, I shoot RAW only. Um, this, it can just shoot uh, DNGs, but I I heard from other people that have shot these cameras that they're not as good. So I just do the, the Sigma X3F files and then I convert it in their software. It takes forever but it, it's worth it, it it's more uh, resolution. Um, just doubling back, I, I'm kind of all over the place here. This is gonna be a longer review than I expected. Um, like I said, everything about this is modern and snappy when you're shooting. I mean, the menus and the there's not really a lag whenever you're doing the controls and stuff, but I do have to say, once you actually take a picture, it takes maybe five second buffer before you can even do anything with the camera or let alone take another picture. So um, that is not fast and modern. So that's another thing is the, the sensor takes a lot of processing power and therefore a lot of time for every single shot. That's a lot of the physical build. So let's get a little bit into the more nitty gritty of the image quality. Like I said, it's extremely detailed for APS-C sensor, it's basically, it's it just insane levels, insane levels of detail. I would say, um, I've, okay, I can't, I can't say it's like a medium format camera, honestly, because I've never shot a medium format camera. But I can say that the for it being an APS-C sensor, it is just immediately noticeable how superior the image quality is in terms of sharpness to a Fujifilm file. Um, so take that information and do with the do with it what you will because you have to pay a lot of prices to get to that. It doesn't have great ergonomics. You don't have really good low light performance. You don't have a really fast lens on here. You only have the choice of the one lens. But if you're okay with paying all those prices, really, really amazing sharpness uh, to the point where I don't think it would even be good for portraiture because the color detail is so accurate that it's not flattering. It has every little different tone in your face to an extent that that is just, it's not flattering for anybody who doesn't have perfect skin for portraiture. So I really have to edit the files in for portraits out of this. I think it's, I, I, it's, it's weird to say this, it's too detailed for portraits, I think. So like I said earlier, I think it serves itself best for landscape photography where you just, you want all that detail or just anything where probably not involving people unless, you know, they're not like a huge subject in the frame just because I don't I, I feel like so crazy saying this because everybody is looking for crazy sharpness on YouTube But I think this is like almost too sharp when I have a like a picture of my dog up close And there's all the the fine details on each individual hair on his head without adjusting the sharpness or anything It looks like an over sharpened image right out of camera. I I swear I've, I've decrease the this the clarity and sharpness on these files just to make them look more natural and, and pleasing but uh, but like I said 
I think it's really a landscape camera. It doesn't, uh, because it's a, a, a APS-C size sensor, it's not gonna have medium format uh, dynamic range for landscape. So you're gonna, you're gonna have to composite different exposures together. And uh, that's just how it is. But I've had, I, you know, in the right situations and the right scenarios, I've gotten some really nice landscape pictures with this that I'm really proud of. So overall, I really enjoyed this camera. It's fun to shoot with, but it's limiting. I feel like I should basically always have it on a tripod to get the full resolution. Because otherwise, even just on a cloudy day, to have an ISO 100 and only a 2.8 lens, if you're going to anywhere that's even slightly shaded, you just can't take photos. And uh, the I'll show you a picture of, this is even, I shot I think shot at base ISO, but I raised the shadows um, on this silo picture. And if you, if you zoom in, the color noise is just awful. So if you're shooting color, um, just definitely keep it at base ISO. If you're okay with ugly color noise, then I guess you could maybe shoot at ISO 200, maybe 400, but you're really pushing it. If you're not gonna bring it back any shadows and post at all, I guess if you're a JPEG shooter. I've heard people say that if you switch it to, to black and white, so the color noise isn't an issue, it, it's more acceptable even up to ISO 800 or even 1600, depending on where your tastes lie. This is such a niche camera, even though I have enjoyed my time with it. Don't hate me any Sigma lovers out there. I do think I'm gonna sell this camera because I think the money I have invested in this is best put, is better put into either just paying my bills right now or reallocating those funds into something for my Fujifilm system or something that's not not a camera because right now right my, my camera collection I'll try to get a shot of this I own like six cameras at the moment so if I can make that five cameras and keep whittling that down I'd, I'd love to be more of a minimalist and use the money that I've put into cameras and lenses because I've sold off some lenses so far and take that money and put it into like just a really good light stand or stuff, stuff that's not maybe as fun as a new, a shiny new camera, but it's more practical and gonna help me with my craft in the long run. Um, I think a light stand was a really stupid example, but like I need to get like a, a really nice tripod and I'm thinking about maybe buying a new flash and thinking about trying out some film photography stuff. So all this stuff costs money and instead of just dumping more and more money into my photography hobby slash business, I could just take the money I already have invested into it and continually try out new things or get to a point where I'm happy 100% with everything I own. And I don't feel like I have any redundancies. I think that's where I'm trying to get to. So I hope you enjoyed this review. I hope you don't hate me for saying that I'm gonna, I'm gonna sell this off. I have enjoyed my time with it. I hope you enjoyed the images that, that I have. And um, if you're thinking about trying out this camera, you have to understand it's a very niche camera. I think um, if you're seriously considering it, you know the kind of photographer you are, and you'll you'll know deep down if, if it's really meant for you and if you should actually buy it. I think for honestly, I mean, not even for me, but uh, as well, but for probably 90%, 95% of photographers, this is not the camera you're gonna want, especially if you just wanna have one camera, maybe like a second camera just for fun, get a second camera that you can change the lenses on. Or get like an X100 if you want to get a fixed lens camera, or just something that's more practical that you can use in more situations. It's just, I feel like it's too limiting. That's all I gotta say, and I hope to see you in the next video, guys. Bye.